Concrete is strong, affordable, formable, and adaptable to a wide range of applications. It is used in small projects like supporting a post or repairing a sidewalk, and big projects like building a new arena or a dam. And in so many other things, you probably seldom give it a second thought, but our world would be much different without it, and it's safe to say we wouldn't like it. Concrete is such a common thing in our normal day, it would take a tremendous effort just to count the interactions. With something this important, surely there's lots to learn about it. So we went to Delisi's Midtown Batch Concrete Plant in Oklahoma City to learn more. Kermit Frank, Vice President of Community Relations and Communications at Delisi Brothers, gave us a tour. A great starting point is to question, what is concrete? Concrete is made by mixing four main ingredients. Gravel, which comes from a quarry. The gravel gives strength and bulk to the concrete. Different size gravel can be specified for a mix. Sand. Sand also gives bulk to the concrete, but its smaller particle size helps fill voids evenly and helps the wet concrete flow. Cement, which sometimes gets confused for concrete. The cement is the binder that holds everything together. And water. Water activates the cement, aids in mixing the concrete, and makes it flowable so that it can be poured into forms. There are other ingredients that can be added as well called admixtures. Examples include products to entrain more air bubbles into the mix, products like fly ash, which reduce the amount of water required and makes a stronger end product, retarders, which slow down how fast concrete cures, often used in hot weather, accelerators, which speed up concrete curing, allowing work to progress faster, good for use in cold weather. Other examples include decorative colors, rust inhibitors, and fibers to resist cracking. Four basic ingredients and a variety of admixture ingredients combine to an almost infinite number of concrete recipes, giving builders and engineers the opportunity to specify the best mix for their particular application. If you saw our video on how cheese is made, there are some similarities. Just four basic ingredients can be manipulated into a huge range of cheese varieties. This Delisi batch concrete plant is equipped to mix up all those different concrete recipes to meet their customer needs. But before we get into how that happens, let's talk about another important aspect of concrete plants. Location, location, location. The Oklahoma City Metro is a busy and growing place, which means concrete is in high demand. So while OKC needs concrete, the ingredients for it have to come from some other places. The sand comes from a spot on the Cimarron River, 35 miles north of downtown OKC. The cement comes from Ada, which is 80 miles southeast. The gravel for the concrete made here comes from a quarry in Lawton, which is a hundred miles southwest. All of those ingredients have to come together in one spot to be mixed into concrete, and it's very important to mix it near where it will be poured, because once mixed, the curing process starts and the clock starts ticking. Though in some cases, the curing time can be stretched, in most cases, the concrete needs to be poured within one hour from when it was mixed. That means that batch plants have to be strategically located to serve the demand area, and all of the raw ingredients have to be transported to and stored at the batch plant. Part of what makes the Midtown Batch Plant special is that it is served by rail. Instead of trucking the gravel to the plant over the highway, Union Pacific delivers it via open-top hopper cars. Each train car delivers the equivalent of four truckloads. Not every batch plant can be sited on a rail line, but
but when it can, it has positive impacts on both the environment and local traffic. Now that we've covered what goes into concrete and the need for batch plants, let's get a look at one up close. Plant manager Gary Reese joined us to show us how it all works. The sand and gravel are stored in giant mounds on the yard. Cement is stored in this tower. There are several types of water supplies depending on the concrete recipe being made. In summertime, that water may even come in the form of ice to slow the curing process. The sand and the gravel are conveyed from the stockpiles to the aggregate scale house. In here, the sand or gravel fills a hopper until it hits a weight called for by the recipe. The gates open and the material gets conveyed to the mixing drum. And then it'll open that gate at the bottom, run up into the drum. And it's laying out sand or stone or cement. The amount of water in the mix is critical to its slump, meaning how easy it flows, and its final strength. And since the sand and the gravel are stored in the open, their moisture content can vary considerably. Simply put, how much water that needs to be added depends on how wet the sand and gravel are. To account for this, there are inline moisture sensors that let the operator and control system know the moisture content of the incoming sand and gravel. Keeping an eye on moisture is so important, these moisture sensors undergo calibration checks twice a week to make sure they are reading reliably. The sand or rock. So we weigh the pan empty, then we put the material in it, then we weigh it with material in there, and then we turn the stove on to cook the moisture out of it, then we weigh it again to see what it is empty, and then we do the calculations, and that will tell us how much moisture was in that sand. The cement gets metered in from its storage tower through a different scaled hopper. It doesn't need moisture sensors because it's stored dry. Cement silo is up in there. That's how what we, the scale. So it, that butterfly valve opens up, drops the cement into the scale. Once it's got enough material, closes that gate. Um, and then it might put flash in there, which is another type of cementitious material. And then once it's got enough, then that scale will open up and put it into that central mix drum down there. So I don't know if you can feel in there, it's hot. We, we, we have heaters in the winter time. We want to keep everything warm, stop from freezing up. We have big heaters in our tunnels to stop the aggregate from freezing when it's coming out the gate. Like making a cake, there's more to it than dumping all the ingredients into a bowl and mixing it up. The order in which ingredients are added makes a big difference in how well it mixes and how the final product performs. How many loads get mixed per day varies, but typically they fill 50 to 60 trucks a day, and it's not uncommon to have an 80 plus truck day. Managing the main ingredients, add mixtures, truck timing, and dispatch tickets, as well as all the systems involved, is a lot of coordination. And it takes place here in the control room. The operator has a screen with dispatch tickets, giving them the details of each load, including its recipe. The operator uses these screens and controls to call for the ingredients, which get measured out in a particular order and added to the mixing drum. Cameras and sensors help him keep an eye on everything. All my uh, scales and um, uh, materials so I got uh, rocks, this is all rocks, sands. This is my powders, this is cement, fly ash. This is my aggregate scale. 
Uh, that would be the bottom of that part. And this is the semen scale is what's inside this room right here. Okay. Uh, this is my different kinds of water that we use, which is just hot, uh, shield water or regular water. And this is my admix, which the is, chemical. Which is That's the sum of that. Th these bottles right here are represented right there on those bottles. Those yeah. are the ones that they measure, they uh, measure it right there. And then it goes into the drum. And then I got some others that is at the right feet. Yeah, so those little bars there, I don't know if you've got them low way up here a little bit. So those little bars there will start out on the left side and then they'll, once they obviously reach 100%, that's when they've got the correct amount of material, whether it's water. When it comes time to transfer the concrete batch from the mixing drum to the delivery truck, he has a direct visual to the transfer out of this window. This system is a fascinating mix of sophistication and ruggedness. The controls are finesse, delivering quality concrete batches that adhere to specifications. The handling systems are heavy duty, moving tons of materials in all kinds of conditions. It works so well, it's easy to overlook the magic of brawn and brains taking place. Now that we have seen how to mix each load, let's take a brief look at the truck that delivers it. Another question I got. So you see like those trucks over there? Why did why are this like this barrel spinning on them? Because you have to once you get the, the materials in the truck, you have to constantly keep it moving. Otherwise it'll get hard. And we don't want it to be hard in our truck. So these trucks are coming back from a job and they might have a teeny tiny bit on or they might have even a little bit more than that. So they're staying, keeping the truck turning. They'll go over to what we call our wash pit and they'll use water and they'll wash out their drum before they go get their next mix. Each of these trucks holds 10 yards of concrete. In concrete terms, a yard is short for a cubic yard meaning it could fill up the space of a cube that measures one yard on each side. In feet, that would be three feet on each side. So three feet times three feet times three feet would be 27 cubic feet. That amount of concrete weighs around 4,000 pounds. Builders know how much concrete they need by multiplying the area they are covering times the depth they want the concrete to be. The math is straightforward multiplication. The only tricky part is making sure to keep the units consistent. Let's look at a quick example. Suppose a builder is pouring a new concrete patio that is 10 feet by 10 feet. He wants the patio to be four inches thick. One way would be to figure out the volume in cubic feet. So 10 feet times 10 feet times 0 0.333 feet. That results in 33.3 .3 cubic feet. To get from cubic feet to cubic yards, divide by 27. So 33.3 .3 divided by 27 is about 1.25 cubic yards. But you don't want to be short on concrete to finish a job. So ordering 10 to 15% extra is usually recommended and can help cover spillage or uneven grades. On smaller jobs, the safety margin may even be a larger percentage. Like Kermit explained, unused concrete that comes back on the truck gets washed out into a settling pond. That material gets recycled into other products. Kermit pointed out something on these trucks we hadn't seen before. They are equipped with a monitoring system called Verify. These Verify systems monitor temperature and slump while the truck is en route to the job site. It can even add water or admixture to make adjustments to the batch, making sure that the load is ready to pour when it arrives on site and is of the right quality. The Verify system is a good example of how concrete technology continues to evolve, even though concrete has been around for over 8,000 years. That's right, 8,000 years. 
Concrete does have a long history, a fascinating present, and a bright future. Thank you, Kermit, Gary, and Delisi brothers for teaching us about concrete and how it gets to where it needs to be. There is so much concrete in our world that we can't promise that we will always stop to appreciate it. But every once in a while, when we cross a bridge or see a construction site, we will pause to contemplate all the things that happen behind the scenes to make these structures possible. See you on our next adventure.